All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming today. So today we have a very special guest. Um, just a little bit of background on Ruth. So Ruth Sherman works with top CEOs, celebrities, and small business entrepreneurs to help them become charismatic speakers, presenters, and video and media darlings. Ruth has worked with some of the world's largest and most prestigious companies, to um, top CEOs, movie stars, international celebrities. Four of her clients have won Oscars, and one of them uh, has won the Pulitzer Prize. Her many film projects include Dallas Buyers Club, Insidious Chapter 3, her first horror film, and the recently opened Suffragette and Trumbo. She loves getting paid to watch movies, but you don't have to be famous to work with Ruth, and she's here today with us, so that's awesome. Her new book, Speakrets, which is outside. Everybody should grab a copy. It's amazing. I read it cover to cover. Uh, the 30 best, uh, most effective, most overlooked marketing and personal branding essentials is the name of her book, is available on Amazon and just outside this room. She's also a widely quoted expert on political communication who knows that the better communicator always wins. Her first career was as one of a handful of successful New York jingle singers whose voice was heard around the world on commercials such as Coca-Cola, Ford, Mishlob, and Clairol, and as a backup singer for major recording artists. Ruth holds a master's degree in speech and interpersonal communication from NYU. Everybody, please welcome Ruth Sherman. Thank you. Thanks, Doma. Thank you. Um, first things first, in order for us to have this discussion, you've got to leave your politics at the door. Do I have your pledge that you will do that? Yes? Shake your head. Just shake your head. Yes. <laughs> this is the hardest thing to do, by the way. It is very hard to not have opinions about candidates because what I'm doing today, of course, is using them to talk about speaking and communication because we're in the midst of this presidential campaign. So this is one uh, uh, presentation that I roll out every four years because I think it's so fascinating to watch how these candidates communicate and influence our vote, or, or at least try to. So leave your politics at the door. The only way that I know that I am doing it right when I get interviewed by media, because they, they call me to ask me what it is that I am, what, what do I think about who is, uh, who's, what the candidates are doing and who's doing a good job and who might win, which I don't predict quite yet. Uh, they always ask me, and I always have to be very careful. We all have our biases, and the only way I know I'm doing it right is when I get hate mail from both sides. <laughs> okay. All right. So there are a couple of reasons that I do this presentation every few years. The first reason is that I think it's important. It's as an expert in communication and somebody who's doing this for a very long time. I think it's my civic duty to inform the voters and people who come to my presentations about just how the candidates use these communication techniques to influence our vote, as I mentioned a moment ago. The second reason is because this is a master class in public speaking. I was talking to a few of you uh, here before we got started. And it's important to pay attention to this because we can learn what to do and, of course, what not to do. And it happens in every single, it, it's constant, it's wallpaper. It, you, you, are, you are bombarded with opportunities to see these people and to watch them and to learn by uh, simply observing them. So those are the two reasons that I do this presentation. So today we'll make some connections between what they do and what you can do to advance in your careers and in your businesses. And um, so the, you know, here they are. This was uh, the second debate, I think, and some people are gone now. So tomorrow night, you'll see the three people in the center for the Democratic debate. How many of you are going to spend Saturday evening watching the Democratic debate? OK, fair enough. <laughs> and you guys are lucky. You don't have to wait until 9 o'clock. I'm in the New York area. I have to wait until 9 PM to watch that. Um, but you can watch it, of course, anytime, because they'll, they'll record it, and you'll be able to watch it on YouTube. Um, so the three in the middle will be there. And then up uh, the Republicans, um, a few of them are now gone or on different stages. And so 
Yeah, so, so things have changed, and they're changing rapidly. It's a moving target, and it's something that I have to constantly figure out and, and work on because, again, you know, there have been so many debates and so many changes that it's been difficult to keep up. And there was, I couldn't even update from the other day because I was so busy. But there was a debate on, um, on Tuesday, I think it was. So it doesn't matter whether you want to move to Pennsylvania Avenue, you want to move into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, or you want to move up in Silicon Valley, the better communicator or the best communicator will win. You, this, I want to make it very clear. You do not have to be perfect. You do not have to be great. You just have to be better than the competition. It's like the Olympics. You just have to win by a fraction of a point. And that is the way it is for these candidates and for you as well. So there are five components to candidate communication success. Let's, let's list five components. The first is presentation skills and public speaking. This is the biggest one. It's the most important one. It's the way that we get to know them a little better, or they try to get us to know them a little better. And we'll spend most of the time on the presentation skills and public speaking today. The second one is content, message. So we're going to spend some time on their slogans and what they use for their slogans. But generally, it's their messaging. What, is, what exactly are they saying? And then beyond the message itself, discipline. How often do they repeat the message? Do they stick with the same message? Are they testing some new versions and variations of the message? And how do they put those? Uh, the sloganeering is great because uh, I find it fascinating because if you put together slogans in a certain way, they should roll off your tongue and they should be very memorable and they should have some kind of a, an emotional impact. The third issue is the personal narrative. This is the story of who they are, how they come to be who they are, and uh, how, how they're formed. And this is another way that we end up feeling like he or she gets me, or he or she doesn't get me at all. And then there are two final uh, communication components that we're, that we're not going to have time to talk about here today. And the, fir the uh, fourth one is interpersonal communication, one-on-one -on -one communication, or one-on small groups. That's very important in business, hugely important in business, but we don't have time to go uh, into that in any detail today. One of the things that you should know is that as the race narrows down and the press pool isn't so um, spread out, spread so thin, that they will be following the two eventual nominees. And what will happen is these nominees will be photographed in the diners, in the boutiques, in the shops, in the, the, the businesses, the manufacturing uh, businesses. Maybe they'll come to Google, but only to get money, right? Because right? they only come to New York and Connecticut to get money. I never see them. We never see them either. But um, so they come, uh, they'll be photographed, and reporters will, war will report on how they interact one-on-one -on -one with the regular folks. OK, that's what they think of, and that's how they qualify it, the regular folks. Um, and then the final communication component is the spouse. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Uh, <laughs> very hard to talk about for obvious reasons. But we do have some interesting spousal possibilities uh, for uh, the potential first you know, first spouse uh, this, this time, right? Um, so, uh, so let's start with a public speaking and presentation. And I want to play a video or two. This was Barack Obama at the 2004 Democratic Convention. How many of you have seen this? All right, this is just a clip. Look at how young he looks. It is that fundamental belief. It is that fundamental belief. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper that makes this country work. It's what allows us to pursue our individual dreams and yet still come together as one American family. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. Now, even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us, the spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them tonight 
there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. The pundits, the pundits like to slice and dice our country into red states and blue states, red states for Republicans, blue states for Democrats. But I've got news for them, too. We worship an awesome God in the blue states, and we don't like federal agents poking around in our libraries in the red states. We coach Little League in the blue states, and yes, we've got some gay friends in the red states. There are patriots who oppose the war in Iraq, and there are patriots who supported the war in Iraq. Okay. So again, look at what happens to you when you spend eight years as the president. You get gray and you get lined. <laughs> All right. I remember where I was when this happened. How many of you remember where you were? Right. Okay. So a memorable talk. You will remember where you were and what you were doing. I was in my bedroom. I was picking up. I was watching the Democratic Convention. It's such a boring thing to watch because they get up. And most of them are terrible speakers, and they speak, and it goes on and on and on. Right. And then I remember hearing him. I nobody. I didn't know who he was. I'd never heard of him before. And I remember hearing his voice and and doing a double take, sitting down on the end of my bed and listening to his talk and thinking, he's going to be somebody. <laughs> Little did I know. Four years later, he's president. Four years later, he's president. All right, let's take a, a look at another video. That, you know, Rudy Giuliani said he thought that there might be some Reagan qualities to Donald Trump. So Carly Fiorina, is he getting the better of you? Well, I don't know. I didn't get a phone call from Bill Clinton before I jumped in the race. Did any of you get a phone call from Bill Clinton? I didn't. Maybe it's because I hadn't given money to the foundation or donated to his wife's Senate campaign. Here's the thing that I would ask Donald Trump in all seriousness. He is the party's front runner right now and good for him. I think he's tapped into an anger that people feel. They're sick of politics as usual. You know, whatever your issue, your cause, the festering problem you hoped would be resolved, the political class has failed you. That's just a fact, and that's what Donald Trump taps into. I would also just say this, since he has changed his mind on amnesty, on health care, and on abortion, I would just ask what are the principles by which he will govern? This In an interview last week in Rolling Stone magazine, Donald Trump said the following about you, quote, look at that face, would anyone vote for that? Can you imagine that, the face of our next president? <laughs> You know, it's interesting to me, Mr. Trump said that he heard Mr. Bush very clearly and what Mr. Bush said. I think women all over this country heard very clearly what Mr. Trump said. I think she's got a beautiful face and I think she's a beautiful woman. All right, on that note. And it's looks could kill, right? Talk about nonverbal communication. All right. So uh, just press this key. Um, one of the things that I think is super important to know is that these two people were nobodies before they communicated to us in a very skilled way. Not Trump. He was not a nobody. But people didn't know who Carly Fiorina was. You knew who she was. I know who she is because I follow business news. But the, in the rest of the country, she was an unknown. She is the only one who made it from the quote unquote undercard debate to the main stage. And she's remained there. Even though in between her debate performances, supposedly, what I understand is her poll numbers decline. But her performances continue to be pretty good. She's a gifted communicator, but she works at it. Same thing for Barack Obama. Nobody knew he, who he was. He had, uh, he had been a, uh, a community organizer in Chicago. He had been a state uh, a senator, state legislator. And then he went into, he became elected, he got elected to the US Senate, and he was there for less than three years when he started running. I think it was about two years 
when he started to run for president. So he, be, he was a nobody, and this was the most fascinating thing to me, because here were two people nobody had ever heard about before. Suddenly, they're players. It opens the door for people. And it, if it opens the door for them, it can open the door for you. So what are presentation skills and, and public speaking skills? They are all nonverbal. They are all nonverbal. How you look, how you sound, how you move, and if you're on a stage, how you travel. And when we talk about uh, traveling on stage, it's not standing behind a lectern necessarily. It's about how you command the room or the stage or the platform, whatever you're on. And then voice has a, is part of how you sound, and it has a, it's in a category by itself. So let's talk a little bit about each of the nonverbal codes. And we call them codes because they are exactly that. They're, they're, um, they are simply not using words, how we communicate without using words. So one of the big things that we've heard about is Bernie Sanders and his hand gesture. Bernie Sanders has his, this hand gesture that he uses. He, when he talks, he punctuates each syllable of each word. And he uses his right hand, and sometimes he gets his left hand into the act, but he punctuates each syllable of each word. And the problem that he's had with that is that when you are speaking, you're speaking in a faster manner. Your syllables are moving more quickly off your tongue than your hand can move. So you're late with your hands. OK? And we'll see that in just a second. Just slightly late, and I'm exaggerating. But you're late, and it's a bit of a distraction because of that. So we're going to take a look at that in a minute. But let's talk a little bit about gestures and why they're so important. The research shows that gestures help us think. They help us think. I know, I don't know about any of you, but when you get to a certain age like I am, you're looking for words sometimes, trying to find words. Sometimes I'm struggling trying to find a word and I'm waving my hand around up here as if I can pluck it out of the air and put it into my brain. And many of us do that. We use our hands and as we express ourselves, we use our hands. And if you watch what people do, even in interpersonal communication, you are using their hands. If there is a culture that does not use its hands to uh, accompany uh, spoke, the spoken word, it hasn't been discovered yet. It hasn't been discovered yet. And one of the ways they know that hand gestures are so important is that blind people gesture and deaf people gesture in addition to signing. So gestures are hugely important. So not only do they help us think, but they help everyone else learn. Nonverbal communication, the way you look, sound, move, and travel, gives meaning to your words. It makes you believable. I'll give you a quick example. If I stood here like this, and I said, I'm Ruth Sherman, and I'm a communications expert, and if you um, stay here and listen to me for an hour, you are going to learn so much about how to be a great speaker. So what I'm doing is I'm contradicting what I'm saying with my body language and my movements. Now, you know, people complain to me when I give that example. Well, Ruth, you know, you're, a, you're a professional speaker. You have to be good at this. You have to model the behavior. And there's an element of truth to that. But the fact is that anybody who gets up and talks about something that they're passionate about has to be able to display that passion. Or because there's so much competition that people will go to the next person who's able to interest and engage that audience. So display your passion. In fact, people often come to me. How many of you feel if you move too much or you become too theatrical, you think of it as too theatrical, too slick, that it will be inauthentic. Raise your hands if you think that it will be inauthentic and not real. Yeah. And people often ask me, you know, I, 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 that's not me. It would be phony. I it would not be authentic. And my response to that is that authenticity is often misunderstood and sometimes overrated. <laughs> and I'll explain that in a minute. And the second thing is I don't care how you feel. I only care, my clients, I don't care how you feel. I only care how you look and sound, because here's what I know for sure. I'm certain about it. That if the way you look and sound is engaging to, with your audience, if your audience is engaged with you, that that feedback will make you feel confident. 
So it's a feedback loop that adds to the confidence, the way you look, sound, move, and travel. Let's take a quick look at Bernie Sanders' hands. Let's see. And what democratic socialism is about is saying that it is immoral and wrong that the top one-tenth of one percent in this country own almost 90 percent, almost own almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. That it is wrong today in a rigged economy that 57 percent of all new income is going to the top one percent. That when you look around the world, you see every other major country providing health care to all people as a right, except the United States. You see every other major country saying to moms that when you have a baby, we're not going to separate you from your newborn baby, because we are going to have, we are going to have me medical and family paid leave like every other country on Earth. Those are some of the principles that I believe in, and I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden, and Norway, and learn from what they have accomplished for their working people. So Sanders is a little bit distracting with his hands. And one of the things, a Time magazine called me right before the Democratic debate of a couple of weeks ago. And they said, well, what do they have to do? And I had been reading, probably, possibly like you did, that Bernie Sanders wasn't practicing, wasn't rehearsing. That was not authentic. OK, that wasn't going to work for him. And I said, you know, if what I'm reading is true, I think it's going to hurt him. And I think that it did hurt him. I don't think that he was ready for the TV camera. It's very different to be in a debate situation where the, you are speaking primarily to the TV audience. In the room are all people who agree with you already. They're all, or, or they're all almost agreeing with you. They're all Democrats in the room. But the people who are um, out there are, are people that you have to persuade, because you cannot win with only one party voting for you. You have to have some votes from the other party and certainly from independents. Uh, the other thing that he does is he leans on the podium. And uh, podiums are made for six foot tall men, not for, uh, or six foot tall people, I should say. But you know, he leans on the podium like this. And it's, it, it is a distraction. And it makes him look older and more hunched than he needs to be. He's a fit man. Um, and he simply doesn't have to, he has to appeal to a much broader swath of the electorate than he's able to if he does it this way. The other thing that he does, of course, is he speaks in a pretty much a loud voice. You know, his voice is loud. It's one volume level. Great for the big arena speeches, the kinds of speeches that he's giving and that he's attracting a lot of people to come to. But one of the things that happens when you speak in one, uh, with one volume level is that if everything's important, nothing's important. So what I noticed, it was interesting because Carly Fiorina, I think, is a gifted communicator and a very, uh, and she works at it. And you know, it's funny. Um, I cannot evaluate her tenure at HP. I cannot. I'm not an MBA. I don't know whether she did a good job, whether she didn't do a good job. I know I read that she didn't do a good job. Um, all of that. I read everything that they put out there about her. But I can absolutely see how she could have persuaded her board of very smart people to do certain things that were perhaps not good for the company. I can see it. Now, that is not what I advocate. I don't advocate it. I advocate, of course, knowing your stuff and doing good things and being able to communicate those good things because the way you speak is the operational vehicle for your message, for your knowledge. How do you get it out there to people, but for speaking to people about it? And you know, for all of the texting and emailing and written language that we use, we still speak far more than we do any of that, far more. And we don't even realize it because we're sitting at our computers typing away all the time. But the fact is that we do it far more, and it's much more efficient. So the speaking voice, um, talked about the speaking voice. I mentioned it. It's in a class by itself because it has several components. Volume, which we just talked about with Sanders. It has a tone, uh, intonation, uh, expression. So the way we use pitch, highs and lows, 
to express our voice and all of the range in between. By the way, every language has its own music, has its own uh, linguistic music. So that's why when we speak um, a foreign language, our native accent is there, because we're using our music in our from our native tongue to speak the, uh, the other language, the foreign language. But uh, the other things that it has, of course, is the accent and dialect, and then, as I mentioned, volume, tone, expression, et cetera, and rate and pace. So let's listen uh, to two candidates back to back, Jeb Bush and Martin O'Malley, both of whom I think have beautiful speaking voices. Let's take a quick listen. Yeah, I'm just, before yeah. I move on from um, Sanders, why isn't he, you know, these campaigns cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Why, and it's pretty clear to everybody, why hasn't he actually addressed it? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I don't have inside information, you think sadly. He knows that this is hurting him? Or, or um, I'm sure somebody's telling him. If I would guess, somebody's telling him, but either he's not listening or he doesn't care or he thinks that it will impact his quote unquote authenticity and, uh, you know. So, so I don't know, but that's the only thing I can think of. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. Let's take a quick look and uh, or listen to O'Malley and Bush, and I'll try to push the right button here. To a certain extent, I always knew this was going to be hard. Uh, I never felt like I was a front runner because we hadn't earned it. We haven't, uh, you know, just starting out on the journey. You've got to go earn it. I've got to get better at debating, I guess, or performing, whatever that's called, and I will. I'm a grinder. I'm very competitive, and so uh, I feel good about where we are. You keep saying I'm a grinder. What does that mean? That means I described it as I eat nails before I have breakfast. I'm I'm focused. I'm competitive. I'm I set high expectations on myself. I knew this was going to be hard. New leadership. You're ready to challenge her, aren't you? Well, I think that our country always benefits from new leadership and and new perspectives. I mean, let's be honest here. The presidency of the United States is not some crown to be passed between two families. It is an awesome and sacred trust that to be earned and exercised on behalf of the American people. Those two people. families, Bush and Clinton? Well, right now, George, you know, the, the, uh, the, any two families. But look, in order for us to make an economy again, where people can work hard and get ahead, we need a president who is on our side. A president who's willing to take on powerful, wealthy, special interests in order to restore that sort of American economy where wherever you start on the earning spectrum, you can get ahead through your hard work. So if we listen to O'Malley and Bush, their voices are very pleasing. I think it was interesting when Bush said, I'm a grinder, I'm a grinder. It's like, well, what does that mean? And don't, you don't look like a grinder right now. You know, so um, he could have, when, when, when she asked him what a grinder was, we could have learned what that was if he expressed it a certain way. Um, but O'Malley and Bush are pretty good. Now, the other thing that happens, um, we did, we, I don't have the recordings of the women's voices, except you heard Carly Fiorina before. The women's voices, Hillary Clinton and Carly Fiorina, they're OK. They're good enough voices. Their voices, they're not beautiful women's voices like, oh, gosh, uh, the, one of the great women's uh, voices right, right now or that you could listen to would be Diane Sawyer, probably the best public voice. Uh, that you can hear from, from a woman, beautifully uh, articulated and, and well done and very well trained, of course. But their voices are good. They're good enough. And they've learned uh, how to create and, and um, use their leadership voices. One of the things that you don't hear from them that we hear a lot, I hear a lot among uh, clients, and you may hear it a lot, but I want you to become more aware of this, is Uptalk. Uptalk sounds like this. Everything sounds like a question. All right, and I'm being very nasal right now, and I'm trying to imitate it. And I'm a girl, I'm a woman, so you know this is the way it sounds when women do it, right? Um, men do it too. Women get nailed for it more, sadly. But that is the way it is. So let me play this for you. You'll hear another habit, uh, which is called vocal fry, uh, which I can't do as well as she can. America's young women are running out of oxygen. What else could explain why so many of them sound like this? So cute, so cute. I'm hi, I'm hi, I'm hi. Which is kind of like my, you know, motto, you know, motto. Kim and Chloe just don't get it, get it, get it. 
<laughs> um, so vocal fry, watch it. That's when you, you know, the air is just coming out so slowly. You're not pushing the air over your vocal cords fast enough. That's what it is. It sounds like I remember when George W. Bush. Now, that's interesting, too. That's an interesting ju juxtaposition. George W. Bush's voice was awful. Awful, awful, awful. All right, so you would think brothers sound alike. They don't. They don't. You know, I, my sisters and I sound alike, but the, I don't know. We lost that gene somewhere. Um, okay, so voice, very important. Be assertive. Use your voice. Uh, you know, if your voice is too high, lower it a little bit. Um, for women, um, men, make sure you push that air over your vocal cords so you don't get vocal fry. All right. I was, what I was going to say a moment ago is when George W. Bush, I remember entertaining the thought early in his presidency of having Henry Kissinger do some kind of work. And I thought, oh, my God, if I have to listen. You know, I've been around a long time. I remember when Kissinger was on TV all the time. I thought, if I have to listen to that every night on the, on the news and kill myself, <laughs> kill myself, only because of his voice. <laughs> um, all right. The other nonverbal code of communication we can talk about briefly today is dress and adornment. Dress and adornment. Uh, everything you weren't born wearing, all the choices that we make. <laughs> All the choices we make, you know, from the way we comb our hair, haircuts, everything, the whole thing. Uh, dress and adornment. There's a uniform, obviously, that the politi uh, politicians have to, have to wear if they're on the debate stages or in a formal, uh, formal setting. The men are going to be wearing a dark suit, a light colored shirt, and a red or blue-ish tie. That's it. All right? The women have more choices, and it's more fraught. It's more fraught. I remember somebody asking me why Hillary Clinton wore that blue suit on the first Democratic debate. I said, I, don't, I didn't think she wanted to stand out as much. She didn't want to be, she's, women are always going to be approached or, or um, criticized, certainly, but there's always going to be comments about what it is that they wear. So I think she wanted to lessen that. And I think it worked for her. Uh, so dress and adornment. You know, I thought a lot about what I was going to wear to here, because I'm not going to wear this to a bank. I'm not wearing this outfit to JP Morgan when I go and I talk to them. I wore a suit yesterday at Accenture in San Jose because I was speaking to a group there. It was different. I knew, and, and I asked Doma, what do, what's the dress code? And she told me informal, and I knew that. I knew it was informal, but I wanted to confirm it because I hadn't been here before. So I thought, OK, well, what can I wear that's informal, but that's still me? You know, still has got a little bit of an edge, a little bit stylish, because I'm not going to come in here in jeans and a t-shirt or, you know, even a khakis and a button-down shirt. That's not me. So, you know, I was glad to be able to find something that I had that I thought would work. Uh, so uh, I'll leave that up to you. That's your, you can, you can let me know whether you think it works or not. But it's working. It's working? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad about that. But the, um, the whole idea that we think, oh, we get up in the morning, um, you know, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, that you think, oh, gosh, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Because what you're communicating, of course, is this is not important. This isn't important. This is important. But guess what? A long time ago, somebody chose this uniform for you. Somebody chose it. And it, in fact, communicates something. You cannot get away from communicating regardless whether you think you are or you think you aren't. One more thing about um, uh, presentation skills and public speaking. In order to, be good, good, to get good at it, you have got to practice. You've got to practice. And you have to say it out loud. In your head does not count. We're all very eloquent in our own heads. We are. We imagine ourselves getting up on a stage or a platform or, or, or conducting that meeting and being wonderful. And it doesn't work that way. If you practice, say it out loud a lot, and then you get to the other side where you can get up there and maybe you're nervous to begin with. And by the way, I don't call it stage fright anymore. I just saw this. I call it stage appreciation. OK? Think about it that way. It's a reframe of that feeling. Uh, but the idea that you might be nervous and you get up on a stage and you're worried about it, if you've practiced, I guarantee you that once you start speaking, it will dissipate. And you'll be able to be yourself and go off the reservation, go off your, your prepared remarks and get back on again much more easily. So practice. Practice plus experience equals spontaneity. 
Let's move on to message, and uh, then we're going to talk about the personal narrative. We're not going to spend as much time on either of those as we did on the presentation skills in public speaking, and then we'll leave enough time for, for questions, because I'd love to hear what you have to say and what your questions are. All right, all in for Jeb. This is Jeb Bush's current, uh, that was on his website a, a, a month or so ago. Uh, I understand that he was, um, that he has a new logo, and I didn't see it on his website, called Jeb Can Fix It. And I'm thinking, fix what? Fix himself? <laughs> fix his presentation? Fix his failing campaign? What is Jeb going to fix? Jeb Can Fix It. Interesting. Yeah? All right. Let's see. Who else? Who knows Carly Fiorina's? This is, this is a test. Who knows Carly Fiorina's um, slogan? Anybody? All right. Pardon me? <laughs> what was that? I didn't hear it. What was it? Tell me. It said HP wasn't that bad. <laughs> Probably. Um, all right. So Carly Fiorina, what about um, Ben Carson? Anybody know Ben Carson's slogan? Pardon? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I said I'd be battle to us on the first try. <laughs> um, what about um, who else? Marco Rubio. Anybody know his slogan? No, right? Hillary Clinton? Nope. Nope. Bernie Sanders. Do you know Donald Trump's? What's Donald Trump's? Make America Great Again. We're going to come back to that in a minute. There's a reason that you know Donald Trump's and you don't know the others. There's a reason. All right. All in for Jeb. Let's see what else we've got here. Not bad. New possibilities, real leadership. Not bad. It's OK. It says, it says a bit about who she is and you know, real leadership. She's going back to her leadership of uh, HP. This one scares me. Honestly, <laughs> heal, inspire, revive. Yes, you've got to revive yourself. You know, you better. Uh, it's um, it, it's like the first two. I don't mind the heal, inspire. I like those. But then revive is, you know, from the dead. I, what you know? What? Um, all right. Are you ready for a new American century? He had just a new American century. I just picked this up a couple of days ago. So he's added, he's testing, or he's using it as a, as a sentence, a question in this, part, in this case. Are you ready for, I like a new American century. I think that that's, it's, it's good. It's inspirational. There's, there's something interesting about it, and, and it rolls off the tongue. Hillary doesn't have a slogan, but she's got a logo. And I first saw this, and I'm thinking, what? What? Uh, and, and you know, it's pointing to the right, and then it, it grew on me. I started to look at it, and I thought, you know, it's modern, it's clean, a lot can be done with it. You can put the, um, you know, you can put the LGBT, LGBT um, you know, rainbow colors on it, and you can also do something like this. <laughs> you know, people will do that. Um, that's the problem with logos. But you, you know, you can. So, you know, not only your your fans can do things with it, but the opposition can also do things with it. Um, and then, of course, we've got "Make America Great Again," which you many of you knew. So let's just break that down. What is a, a slogan? A slogan is a combination of words that is uh, framed in a way that has an emotional impact. Framing is a way of inserting a point of view into one word or a few words. And it, it, we want to keep an economy of words, but it's not ultimately necessary, always necessary for them it to be a very few words. My favorite one word um, frame right now is Democrat as an adjective. Democrat Congress, Democrat President, Democrat idea, as opposed to democratic. That's an, a very interesting frame. Um, make America great again. This is what I call a goddamn it statement. It's a goddamn it statement. So um, let's do an analysis of the words. Make, it's a command, right? Make. We're going to make, I'll make, you make, we make. America, self explanatory, the country, our great country. Uh, great. Great, everybody thinks of America as great, or we want to think of America as great. Not everybody does, but we want to, we hope to, we aspire to that. And then again, ah, that's the key word. 
That's the key word again. America was great once, it isn't anymore, and with, go with Donald Trump, it'll be great again. We'll, you know, stick with me and we'll ha it'll happen again. So this is a frame, it's a frame. The other thing that happens with this, with this slogan is the way the word endings and beginnings are. So make America a, so the end of make is a k sound and then America's a vowel, right? It's a hard A, uh, a short A, I should say. So make America flows great, make America great. Nah, that's a little bit uh, different, not as smooth, but great again. So it flows, it's, it rolls off the tongue really easily. So this is what Trump does, and he does it very, very well. And the other thing that he does is he keeps it, he repeats it all the time. This is called message discipline. It's on his hat, he does it on his Insta. Does anybody ever watch his, anybody connected with his Instagram? Do you follow him on Insta? Oh, he's amazing, just amazing. He blows me away as a media, uh, he's a media expert. He's the, a genius at keeping himself in the public eye on the front page, um, you know, getting ink. In fact, the journalists I talk to complain that because media is so corporate at this point, they want, they, they keep Donald Trump in the news because it sells papers and it sells advertising time. This is, it's a sad but true thing about our, uh, our, our uh, media industry. They should be protecting us. I don't think they're doing as good a job as they should with this. So make America great again. A goddamn it statement the, that, that rolls off the tongue really easily. As I was talking about earlier, a great one word frame now, Democrat. Uh, some Republican uh, message mavens, uh, Frank Luntz. Anybody know who Frank Luntz is? He's, he's a wonderful, um, smart, uh, G, um, Language, he's a sociologist, I believe, and, but he does a lot of the polling. He's a pollster for the Republicans. Uh, he has a book. You should get this book. It's called Words That Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. Not what you say, it's what people hear. It's all about framing and using advertising, and he's created a lot of different frames. So think about these frames in politics. Tax cuts or tax relief. Tax cuts, tax relief. Tax cuts, eh, we hear that all the time. Tax relief implies that there's, um, uh, there's a, a oppression. There's oppression and there's been a bad guy, a villain, and then somebody rides to the rescue and lifts the uh, pressure off of you and your taxes go down and everybody's happily, happily ever after. All right, another one, a drilling for oil or energy exploration? Which would you rather, which, which can you get behind? You know, what can you get? They're the same thing. They're the same thing. Um, here's another one, estate tax or death tax, Ugh. right? Not only do I have to pay taxes when I'm alive, when I die, they take more taxes. It's like, ah, uh, right? At estates, that's from Greenwich. That's where I live, in Greenwich, Connecticut. You know, that's where the estates are, and around here. That's where the estates are. Um, one of the, as I mentioned, Democrat as a, uh, as a, um, a one word frame that you'll hear more and more. A new frame that I've heard as they talk about the Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare, uh, they talk about entanglement in Obamacare. Entanglement is never a good thing. That's what our banks do to us. They entangle us, right? We've got our credit card with them, we're checking our savings, our you know, investments, whatever it is. And what ends up happening is if you want to change banks, you've got to go through a lot of stuff to do it. It's called being entangled. They're talking about uh, the ACA now as entanglement. Very interesting. Um, business frames. Why do I want a grande when a medium is the same thing and cheaper? Why do I want that? Because it's a grande. And um, you know, uh, I, it gets served by a barista versus a coffee server or, or a counter person. A counter person serves tepid coffee in a chipped porcelain cup. A barista serves delicious uh, fair trade coffee in, um, you know, in, in a, a cool Christmas cup, just to stay with the time, right? <laughs> stay with the stick with the times. Uh, a red cup, a Christmassy cup, a holiday cup, and there's Wi-Fi. There's, there's, it's a frame. It's a frame. Um, the other thing, let's see. Um, let's see, uh, there was one more that I wanted to make sure that I have. Oh, gambling 
or gaming. Gambling, sinful, gaming, fun, right? So it's very fascinating what people do about this and saying you can use it too. You can absolutely use uh, frames as you're doing, going through your, um, your presenting your ideas in your meetings to your higher ups, to your colleagues. Think about what's in it for them. What is it about the frame? What, what is the aspirational piece of that? Because that's what a good frame does. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel better. It makes you think that your life is going to be better or your work or your business is going to be easier if you do what it is that you're saying, if you framed it the right way. So start thinking about that and start thinking about also the message discipline, repeating it over and over and over again. We want it to be aspirational and you want to repeat it. By the way, test it and you'll see this. Just like we saw with Marco Rubio's, um, I think it was this last one. Nope, that was I'm with stupid, sorry. Here we go. You know, uh, um, with Rubio, he's testing this new piece of it. He's putting it into a question. But before it was just a new American century. He's testing it. We'll see. So they test things just like we do, just like you do in business to see what works. All right, let's go to the personal narrative. One other thing I noted, like at this global, which I think makes it beautiful, is basically. You see that first is trying to empathize with the people in America who think that America is not great anymore. And then once he does that, then he makes a statement, I am going to prove it. And these two parts combine, like make this message much more than awful as compared to all the other messages that I've seen here. Absolutely. It's a simple frame, but I think, you know, it's not new. It's not a new combination of words. In fact, it was used around the Reagan administration. They framed it or when Ronald Reagan was running for office. There are, there are only so many words, simple words and simple uh, declarative set, uh, statements that, there, that exist that will work in these, in these contexts. But I think it's his discipline. He found a good, he found an excellent combination of words. This was not an accident. It was an, a good frame and he repeats it ad infinitum. He repeats it constantly. Let's uh, see what I've got here. Would you like to see him run? No. I really don't. I think it's a great country. There are a lot of great families. There are just there are other people out there that are very qualified, and we've had enough bushes. Having trouble sleeping at night? Too much energy? Need some low energy? You may have an HSA in some companies, some companies don't. But I think the norm ought to be... Jed, for all your sleeping needs. So yesterday I announced I'm running for president. We're going to make America great again. I'm going up to New Hampshire in a little while. Lots of fun. Make America great again. The Academy Awards last night were absolutely terrible. Boring, ugly sets, everything. I have the perfect host for next year, me. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he, he's, he's interesting. He's an interesting guy. Um, OK, let's talk about the personal narrative, the story, the core um, uh, the hero journey that each person in the world takes. Some people have a better hero journey story than others, like Barack Obama had a fantastic hero journey story. But what happens if, you're, if you've been raised either wealthy or middle class, you don't have that much hardship, you haven't had to overcome the same kinds of things that um, you know, somebody like Obama had to overcome, or like Ben Carson now, who's talking about what he's had to overcome. Um, so what do you do about that? Well, it's another way that we get to know people. One of the things that I think is interesting as we look at Hillary Clinton, she was raised by a middle class, in a middle class family. Her father was a businessman. Um, her mother, she talks about her mother having to been thrown out of the house or having to had, uh, uh, leave home at the age of 14 and make it on her own. So she's talking about that, but that hasn't quite connected with people yet. It hasn't quite connected. I don't know that it will. 
skill. I think that there are certain times when you just have to run on your resume, and I think that's what she will end up doing in terms of telling her story and how she came up and how she uh, came up uh, through, through the women's movement and became a professional lawyer and a partner in a firm and all of her work for uh, women's, um, girls and women, uh, et cetera. And her, her resume is very, it's very lengthy and quite impressive. Uh, Carly Fiorina, from secretary to CEO. Little alliteration there. And we can make fun of her and think like she also was raised in a middle class or upper middle class family. I don't think she had much hardship growing up. But the idea that she was a secretary, you know, she's and I are about the same age. She, when, when I started working, I was a receptionist in an accounting firm in New York. I couldn't get a job. I wasn't an accountant, but I wouldn't have been able to get a job like you, like all of the women now uh, graduate college and get real jobs, real professional jobs. It's an amazing transformation. I sometimes think, think the women's movement is stalled, but then I come to places like this and Google and Accenture yesterday, and I think, like, thank God it's not, it, has, it hasn't stalled. Uh, people are, it, it, it is much better. It feels glacial. But that's going to be Carly Fiorina's um, frame. Donald Trump has a problem, uh, frame, uh, story. Donald Donald Trump has a problem uh, talking about his life. He came from a wealthy family. His father was a developer. He mentioned one thing about his, has a, had a brother who died um, a, a, a unexpectedly or too young, uh, I think from alcoholism. I think that was it. But he doesn't talk about it much, so we don't really know much about him. But we don't really care because Donald Trump isn't expected to be introspective. So it's consistent. It's interesting. It's consistent with his brand. Uh, Bernie Sanders has uh, the story of uh, you know, he's been in politics now for 25 or 30 years. I think about, yeah, about 25 or 30 years. So he can't go back and say, well, I'm, I'm sort of an outsider. I'm not. He's not. Uh, but what is it? He comes from a small state. Uh, what is it that Bernie Sanders can bring to the table? He's a, a father, I think, of four children, a grandfather of seven. He talks about that a lot so that people can and relate to him in that way. Uh, ben Carson, we know his story, and now they're starting to pick on him about it. I don't know whether any of it's true, whether it's not true. I don't have any idea. But if it's, it, you know, it's compelling stuff, if you think about it. One of the most interesting things, uh, as I was following politics in the, um, well, I remember when George Bush uh, was running against John Kerry. Um, now, George Bush is from like one of the first families of American politics, the Bush family. Uh, been in politics and uh, wealthy New Englanders and then in Texas uh, oil business for, for decades. Um, but so, so George Bush was running against John Kerry. John Kerry got the reputation as being the patrician. George Bush, his story was that his narrative was that he would be filmed on his ranch clearing brush in his flannel shirt and his jeans and his cowboy boots and his cowboy hat and his dogs in tow and in his dusty pickup truck, right? Clearing brush. That's what he was always doing on his weekends. John Kerry was windsurfing off Nantucket. You don't do that if you want to be, you know, if you want to run for president and you want people to think that you're not the, the patrician one. So their personal narrative is going to be very important. They're going to flesh this out and it's going to come, come up and we're going to see it. For you, in business, it, you don't want to get too personal, not with not not in a large group, not certainly not with your colleagues, close colleagues and, and people you have good relationships with. Yes, you can tell them some of your struggles. But in business, leaders that I work with are always advised to find something that they can talk about where it didn't work out so well for them, where they failed and how they struggled with that failure and how they fixed it and came back, whether it was they were fired or they failed on a big project or something of that nature that makes them seem more human. People will connect with you if they think, like I said at the outset when I was introducing this, if they think that you are a human being who can relate to them, who gets them, who knows what the cost of an, an evening uh, out for dinner would be, who knows what the cost of a roll of toilet paper would be. So I want to close by telling you that it doesn't matter whether you think you are good at this 
or you think you're not. These are skills that can be learned. This is not inborn. These are concrete skills that can be learned. I would imagine that Google has all kinds of workshops if you need to go a little further, there's the National Speakers Association. If you need, and they have a San Francisco chapter. If you need to go further but closer to home, look for your Toastmasters chapter or somebody start one here at Google. If you ha don't already have one, I would, you have one. Yeah, you have probably several, right? Several chapters, yeah. Okay, not a surprise. Go do this stuff. Get better at this. Get some objective feedback because it will advance your career. Because here's the truth, no matter how much, how, how much experience you have, how long you've been in business, how much you love what you do, criti and critically how smart you are. If you cannot, if you, if you don't have a commanding presence, if you uh, don't know how to communicate, you will continue to struggle, you'll continue to um, be underpaid and under-recognized, and you'll continue to, to labor to, to get the people to you know, to find you and, and help you and promote you and give you the bonuses and the recognition that you deserve. These are the skills that, um, that, that cure all those ills more quickly than anything else. A colleague of mine calls it a shortcut to sales. It's a short, there are no shortcuts in life except communication and public speaking. Thank you very much. Thank you. What questions do you have? Uh, so I remember Barack Obama being very articulate and having a sense of, you know, he was really speaking to me or he was really had a message. Yep. Um, and since he's been president, uh, it seems to me he's gotten worse. Do you think that's yes, true? Yes, he has. And um, I, I think that um, Obama was a great uh, reader of, of scripts. He's a great reader of scripts on a teleprompter. He's not great off the cuff. I mean, he knows how to memorize a stump speech, and he knows how to get out there and engage an audience. But um, what ends up happening, and this happens with all of them, by the way. It's not just Obama. We expected more of him, I think, because he was so wonderful as a speaker. He was so like, whoa, we'd been wandering in this desert of bad communicators for too long. I had been. I don't know about you. I certainly had been. Um, and, uh, and then, we, and then he, they do it over and over again. It gets boring. It gets boring. It doesn't, they don't do anything new. So, I think um, uh, a lot of us here, we don't give as many presentations as you do, of course, or any of these politicians. And then at least what happens to me and probably many of us here is that we all of a sudden are called upon by our, our manager, hey, I want you to give a talk. Like this happened a few weeks ago to me. Oh, my manager said, would you give a talk to these 200 people at this? I'm like, oh, man, OK. Uh, you know, how do you? I'm out of practice, so to speak, and like you said, you need to practice, but then we don't have that many opportunities, so how do you get practice without, so that you're ready for when the moment comes without, kind of like being a backup quarterback, you know? Totally get it. Um, you, you get rusty is what you're saying. You know, you, you, know, you, you get rusty. I get rusty too. Uh, my practice for this started six weeks ago. I've done this presentation. I'm a professional speaker. I speak all the time. But I started six weeks ago. I had notice, of course. Um, started putting it together. I had to, you know, every four years it changes. And then the last couple of weeks, I said it out loud every day, every day, because when you say it out loud, just and, and I know you don't get that same kind of notice. And I'd like to know how much time you did have. You had two weeks. Okay. One week. Okay. It's not ideal. It's not ideal, but it's something. How long was the presentation? Fifteen minutes. Okay. So think of it. So let me just give you the. Um, words per minute um, calculation. We speak at about 140 words per minute, and a 15-minute talk, then, you know, just do the math on that. On, on that. So, like, you know, 2,000 words or 1,500 words, something of that nature. Now, you're not going to write it all out, but as you say it, you've got to practice it, and you can use a speaker clock, like I have, to time yourself. And you can use notes. I'm using notes today, everybody. I'm looking at my speaker's notes on here. I don't, there's no law against that. You don't have to do, are you allowed to use notes or slides? You've got it. okay, good. So yeah, just use your notes. But practice enough, I mean, if, you're, if you've got a week to do this, then you're going to have to get to work quickly. Practice by yourself, you mean? Yep. With the video camera? Or? You, don't, you could use a video camera, but if it's going to be too much of a pain in the neck or to phone, you know. Yeah, well, even so, yeah. Uh, if it's going to be too much of a pain in the neck to set it up and, and get that going, and if you're not going to watch it, then don't bother. I and mean, that's the biggest thing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's 
very painful to watch yourself on video. It's like 100 times more fa painful than listening to your voicemail, right? It's, it's terrible. Uh, I mean, even my celebrity clients are like, oh, God, don't show me that. You know, it's like, you got to watch yourself. But unless you're going, if it's going to stop you from practicing, don't bother. Don't bother. Um, it's ideal if you can do it that way, but only if you're going to watch it. But saying it out loud is the key. What you also find, and this is something I didn't mention, when you say it out loud enough, the speech centers in your brain are activated. And things that you didn't even consider to say, like all kinds of pithy things come to mind that you wouldn't have considered. So keep that in mind. So saying it out loud, and you probably have to say it out loud every day, probably several times a day. Another tip is to not only not always start at the beginning, because then, of course, you know, you get interrupted, and you put it down, and then what happens? You come back, and you start again at the beginning, and the beginning's great, and the middle and the end suck. They do. That's what happens. So you have to start in the middle sometimes and take it to the end, or so go over some chunks that are troublesome. See how the words roll off your tongue. One thing I've been practicing. I think one thing that I, I've been practicing after watching myself do this presentation, which wasn't, which was let's say less less than optimal, I um, I realized I speak really quickly, and then now I'm trying to actually do that in everyday life. And so, how do you apply your techniques that from presentations that you give to you know hundreds or thousands of people to kind of groups of two to you know one to three or four? Well, I will tell you that I also have the uh, problem of speaking too fast, and it's a constant tape that's playing in the back of my head to modulate my rate. Uh, so I used to, on my notes, put a big slow down, slow down on every page. And then it became wallpaper, and I had to change the color or change the, right? You, you, you blank it out after a while. So I give myself some kind of a tip or, or helper or some kind of a cue that enables me to pay attention to that. And then after you do it enough and you see how slowing down enables you to think better, it enables you to think better and come up and, and then entertain questions and not get perhaps flustered if you make a mistake or you're reading the room and things aren't going that well or you think they're not, you imagine they're not going well. I mean, just because people aren't looking at you doesn't mean they're not going well. But those are some of the things that I do and that I've tried to do. And then the more you do it, the better you get, which is another reason, I think, to, to do it more regularly and join a, 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 do more Toastmasters, do more, have more opportunities, and volunteer more for opportunities if you're not. It's a pain. It's hard work. It's hard to get good at this. So that's another, it's an addition. But that is, then it's like riding a bike. You get it, and you've got it, and then you only have to like we said earlier, just you get rusty and you just refresh. You refresh. I noticed, started paying attention to your hand gestures after you called them out, and no doubt you must practice them. No, that's I'm just very animated. Surprising. <laughs> yeah, I'm just very animated. Yeah, and not everybody has to be as animated as I am. So that they. The, do they come naturally to you, they, or did yeah. you? Is there a set of particular hand gestures that work better than others, or, or ones that you recommend for people that <laughs> yeah. it does not come naturally to? Okay, so 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 I think maybe that answer I gave you was uh, f to flip uh, that. No, I don't practice. Of course, over the years I've worked on it. All of this is technique. It's technique. It's as if you're learning a golf swing or a tennis swing or you're learning to play uh, a, a musical instrument. You're learning technique. And that's what this is. So one of the techniques that I learned uh, with, in terms of hands is keeping them below, you know, not waving them around in front of my face, not having them up here too much. If I'm on a stage like I am now, a stage, an ish, a stage, you know, a platform, where I have more physical space and latitude, I can be more expansive. If I'm in, on a video, I have to keep it smaller. It's one of the problems that Bernie Sanders, I think, 
had when he was in the de at the Democratic debate. I'll be very interested to see what he does tomorrow. Um, I'll be very interested to see if he, if he pulls it in a little bit for TV, which is different. It's a box. But uh, keeping them lower, um, being uh, using them to enhance my words, to give meaning to my words, because they do that. And then also not doing things like this or putting them in pockets. Pockets are dangerous. They really are. They're dangerous. Or putting them behind my back. I can't get my hand out of my pocket. Putting them behind my back or like this. They call this fig leaf. Fig leaf. <laughs> all right? Next time you watch a politician at the podium, watch all the aides standing there like this fig leaf. <laughs> so these are, yes, yeah, so those are some things not to do. And just ha watch how you move your hands in your one on one conversations, your informal. You know, Google conversations as you're moving through your daily life here and elsewhere. I guarantee you, you use them. You just have to bring that to the stage. Are your techniques universal, or are they just for the American culture? Would this work in Brazil? Oh, great question. Thank you. Yes, uh, n this is American business uh, speech culture that we're talking about today, for sure. Uh, it is different in other cultures, as you, as many of you already know. Okay, so what what is your native country? India. Okay, so it's going to be different in India. It's going to be different in India. It's going to be different in even even in other English speaking countries. Different in the UK. Different in in Canada. Although, although Canadian speakers are very very similar to U.S. business speakers. But yes, so I guess what I would say here, if you are speaking in the US, you have to, you have to when in Rome, as they say, do what the Romans do. Uh, and if you go back and speak in India or elsewhere, make sure you do your homework and see what it is they're going to find appealing and what it is they're going to find off-putting. That's what I have to do. And I get in trouble. I get in trouble. What, what do you suggest? Uh we should do if you can, you know, when you can see you're losing your audience. Oh, God, that's, that's any, an awful feeling. Yeah, do you have any tips or suggestions okay, on how you can bring tip. them back? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things that you have to do beforehand, you can prevent losing your audience. You can. By making sure that your content has what we call rhythm. Rhythm is the interspersing of stories, quotes, uh, statistics, um, funny things that happen to you or have happened to you, on a, on, and they happen to us on a daily basis, or a, an interesting article that you read, some kind of uh, uh, any kind of public information that you can bring in to your presentation and interspersing it throughout the presentation because if the presentation is all theory, all theoretical, or all data, all technical, you will lose your audience. They will. You will. I don't care where you're working or what you're doing. As human beings, this is how we connect. And there are ways to make your information come alive and in, have people enjoy it. What I did today was I, I don't have it in color. I don't have my notes in color. I color code my outline. My outline is my points, the theory, the data, the, the, the boring stuff, the, the OK, the all the stuff that turns me on and turns everybody else off is in yellow, highlighted in yellow. The stories are in pink, and the applications show of hands, audience participation. Maybe I'll put a video up there, or I'll tell a funny story and get people to laugh, where people are physically engaged in some way. That's in green. If I see everything, there's too much yellow, I got to change it, because I know I'm going to lose the audience. So that's what you do. You want to prevent it to begin with. The second thing that you want to do is if you do see people falling asleep, doing other things, you know, not engaged, their body language, whatever is going wrong, or you think it's going wrong, maybe it's not your fault. Maybe they had a bad night. Maybe the baby took, kept, them, kept them up all night, or they're sick, or they've got, just had a bad phone call before they came into your meeting, and you know, something's going badly. So it's not always your fault. I kind of try to go there when, I'm, when I feel like I'm losing an audience. But I think you can prevent it for the most part. And that was a huge lesson for me. Because just like everybody else, all that theory, all that theoretical stuff, all the you know, how to breathe to give a good speaking voice, it's like, no, 
no, don't, you know, I, I hired a coach to help me. No, oh, you can't say that. It's boring. Okay. So it's a big lesson. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I hope you all have a good weekend.